Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to class. Everyone looks excited and ready to go. It is a new EMT course, so I'm hoping we can carry this excitement all the way through the year and we can all pass, graduate, go move on and be happy. Um, today, I'm going to do a short lecture, hopefully about 10 to 15 minutes. Once I complete that, we're going to take a break. There's, there's 10 of you guys, so we're going to do two groups of five. We'll go to, one will go to one lab group and one will go to the other with an instructor. And I'll uh, tell you further about that once we finish. But just so you kind of have an idea of what we're doing. So what I want to discuss with you today, this morning, is going to be scene size up and primary survey. This is just a building block for your medical and trauma assessments. You will utilize these on every patient that you come in contact with. So I want to start this building block early, before treatments, before uh, decisions on transport. And the reason I want to do that is because I want to make this first give you the knowledge. Then I want us to practice. And I want you to have this to the point of muscle memory. So when we start adding treatments in and transport decisions, you don't have to think about these steps. You walk in and you do it. So that's what we're working on today. So your scene size up, first off is always your PPE. Your PPE could be gloves, mask, gown, um, face shields. Do you need a full Tyvek suit for this call? So it's just gonna be call dependent. So our PPE is first, and then our, our scene safety. Scene safety is your number one priority. Your scene safety starts from the time you catch this call, on the way to the call, while you're on scene, until the call's finished, and you're back in service. It's fluent, it's ever-changing. You have to be constantly aware while you're trying to care for these patients. It could, your hazards on, for your scene safety could be another aggressive individual, animals, dogs, any kind, any kind of animal that people have some different kinds of animals at home, so keep that in mind. Um, weather, electrical type situations. It could be that you're on the interstate and you need to park that ambulance in order if someone strikes that ambulance it goes a different direction than where you and fire department and law enforcement are working. Protect those scenes. That's all part of your scene safety. The next thing will be our um, mechanism of injury, which is going to be your trauma patients. Any type of force that is placed on the body that causes injury. And that list is unlimited. And we'll get into those and uh, the different mechanisms and uh, treatments later on. So your nature of illness is going to be your medical patients. You know, your difficulty breathing, your chest pain, your abdominal pain, and also included in this is going to be our um, patients that are having uh, psychological emergencies. They are also included in your medical patients. We want to know, let's just recap, our PPE, we got that. Our scene safety, which is in priority, fluid, never changing. Mechanism of injury, nature of illness, and we want to know the number of patients that we have. If you go out and you've only got you and your partner only have one patient, you guys can probably handle that. If you get out and you've got three or four patients, you're going to need another ambulance. You're going to need maybe some fire department, law enforcement, depending on on the need. So that leads us into, do we need any additional resources? And it could be the coroner's office. You know, we may have an incident where we have a fatality, but over here we have four viable patients. So law enforcement will handle and secure that scene for us while we take care of the viable patients. And we have this DOA that coroner needs to be notified so that everyone can start their investigation. So we have PPE, scene safety, mechanism of injury, nature of illness, do we need any additional resources, and um, at this point what you're going to do is make a determination if you need to do manual stabilization and secure this patient's uh, C-spine. We, we do this now because we make that decision before we ever lay our hands on these patients because someone will have to hold manual C-spine 
as we saw in my previous video when we did the supine patient uh, immobilization. Okay, now that we've completed our scene size up, we're gonna move into our primary survey. Primary survey consists of forming your general impression of your patient. This can start from your dispatch information. Now, it may not be accurate once you arrive on the scene, but it can make your mind start to think of what you may have when you get there. But as you roll up on the scene and you clear your scene safety and go through those steps, as you're approaching, it could be, say you're going in a residence. As you approach this residence, you know, be looking for any kind of signs or that will give you any information, you will be amazed at what you can find. But say you step inside that doorway and your brain goes, we have a GI bleeder. Because you have smelled that smell before and your brain automatically tells you, just from that odor, that this is a GI bleed patient. It could be that you walk through the house and you smell the smell of ammonia. This could be a, a, a patient with cirrhosis with some renal issues that is kind of off-gassing, you could say, those, that odor of ammonia. So what I'm trying to get into is lead, use your senses, your sense of sight, your sense of smell. What do you hear as you roll up on the scene? What do you hear as you approach that door? As you walk down that hallway, do you hear a dog barking? Going back to your scene safety. Do you hear glass breaking? Do you hear screaming and yelling? Do you smell an odor of a sick patient? Do you hear snoring? Do you hear grunting? Do you hear um, any kind of audible respiratory sounds? So forming your general impression, you can begin this before you ever see your patient. So once you approach your patient, say you walk into the room, does your patient appear to be conscious and alert? So when you step in the room and you say, Mr. Smith, does he turn and track and look at you? Is your patient slumped over in the floor? Are they sitting up in a tripod position, working with everything they have to get their next breath? This is all forming your general impression and you have not even touched your patient. What does their skin look like? Are they yellow? Do they appear blue around the mouth? You know, uh, fingertips, if you're able to notice that before you get to them. Does the uh, patient appear to be in no distress at all? Are they clammy? Are they warm and dry? Are they pink? Are they just really flush? So these are all things that you can make a determination before you actually physically get to them. So as we form our general, general impression, our next step is gonna be this patient's level of consciousness. There's some tools that we kind of pack back and utilize on every single patient. And the first thing that we utilize is our AVFU scale. This is to help you determine your patient's level of consciousness. This is not necessarily how you're gonna determine if your patient's full mentation. That will be done with your Glasgow Coma Scale. Just to kind of hit on both, your AVPU, is your patient alert? And are they alert and oriented to person, place, time, and event? The thing about AVPU is they can be alert and oriented, but only to person and time and not all four parts of that scale. So it makes it a little more generalized, but it is just for your level of consciousness. So if you do find out that they're not, say there's only two aspects in there that they are alert to, you need to notify the hospital when you give your report, and that gives them a bigger and better picture of their level of consciousness. So does the patient respond to a verbal response? Mr. Smith, are you okay? And he turns and he looks at you. He's got a great verbal response, according to your app. Do they only respond to painful stimuli? If you're gonna check painful stimuli with a patient, if I like to check here, don't ever leave a mark and don't ever injure your patient. So I like to pinch here, because it's pretty sensitive. Anytime you check one side of your patient, always check the other side. This could be a patient that already had some type of paralysis in the past that we didn't know about 
or this could be a trauma patient that does have paralysis and you pinch one side only and you don't get a response, but if you had checked here, you would have. So our AVPU, if they don't respond to painful, they're completely unresponsive. So that's your AVPU scale just to determine your level of consciousness. To get more specific and to get into our true mental status of our patient, and we're gonna use the Glasgow Coma Scale which it's a lot of information and I put it up here. It's in your books, it's in your, um, your outline for the course. We've included it in there also. Number one is your best eye response. So is it spontaneous? Mr. Smith, and he looks and he, he turns his eyes directly to you. Then he gets a spontaneous number four on his Glasgow Coma Scale. So I guess I should, you can tell by reading that obviously the higher the number through these three things, the better your patient's mentation. So spontaneous on eye response, if he responds to a verbal command, Mr. Smith, so he, did, he didn't have his eyes open initially, but you go Mr. Smith, he's like, and he looks at you. Then he's gonna get this response to a verbal command. If he appears to be unresponsive and you check with painful stimuli and you get a response, then he gets a response to pain. So we go four, three, two, and then absolutely no eye opening whatsoever is gonna be a one. So best verbal would be patients completely oriented. They can answer every question that you ask them and they're not confused. They get, a num they get a five for that. If the patient is confused, so they're conscious but confused, they're gonna get a four. If you ask them a question, you get inappropriate words that just really doesn't make a whole lot of sense, then they're gonna get a three. If it's incomprehensible, they're gonna get a two. So if you ask them, Mr. Smith, do you have any pain? And he goes, Thursday, then at that point you know Mr. Smith has some incomparable, incomprehensible responses. So one is nonverbal. That means no verbal response at all. He would get a one. So your best motor, which is your last aspect of your Glasgow Coma Scale, if you ask them to touch their nose and they're able to touch their nose, or if you ask them to take your pen and hold your pen, and they follow your commands, they get a six. If they localize to pain, so they're not sitting there um, doing all everything that you ask them to do, but if they localize to pain, then that is their best motor response. For withdrawal, so we're at the pain, so if you do a painful stimulus to try to gain a painful response and they withdraw from that pain, that's a four. So if they, if you have a patient that uh, when you do a painful stimuli, they flex, that is a three. So they kind of, they'll kind of flex in or if you, you know, pinch the, the shoulder and they, they kind of flex or extension. So if they have a, an extension response to try to get away is a two. And, no, and one again is no motor response. So say we go out and we have a patient that we believe is having a stroke. So we go out and we're going through this and I walk in the room and I'm like, Mr. Smith. And he goes, and he looks at me. So he gets a four for his eye response. I go to verbal. Mr. Smith, can you say you can't teach an old dog new tricks? And he can't give any verbal response at all. So we go to nonverbal. He gets a one. Best motor? You ask Mr. Uh, Smith if he can hold his arms out in front of him. And then you're blown away because he holds his arms out in front of him, he can close his eyes, 
and he has no drift whatsoever to his upper extremities. So we go, at that point, he's able to follow commands. So he gets a six. So his total Glasgow Cone Scale score is a 10, 11. <laughs> Just kidding. His total score is 11. And in my eyes, I'm saying, right now, this gives me something to gauge Mr. Smith from because he's 11 right now, but he has no verbal response. And his family states, before I got here, you know, this initially started, he could talk just like you and I. So I know that there's something going on, but this 11 is something for me to gauge from. And you can go back through this and it can be ever changing throughout your assessments and his score may change. So with that, that gives us his mentation. So we've done our general impression, our level of consciousness using our AVPU for our LOC and our Glasgow Coma Scale for the true mentation of our patient. So we're gonna move on to chief complaint. If your patient is able, you want them to give you the chief complaint in their own words. We wanna use some open-ended questions we don't want to use closed ended. We don't want any yes or no answers. We want them to tell us what their chief complaint is. And that's going to be the most accurate. So next will be any life threats. We haven't discussed treatments, that kind of thing yet, or any or life threats. We haven't talked about how to control major bleeding. We haven't talked about any airway management. So we will get to that. I want you to understand that life threats is the next step in your primary survey so we can start learning that. So when we do add treatments, we already know the steps and we're not gonna have to think about it. We can think about what our treatment is gonna be. So next would be your ABCs. I wanna know if the airway is open. Is the airway clear? Do we have, uh, do we need suctioning? Do we need a nasal pharyngeal airway, an oral pharyngeal airway? Can we just position this patient into a different position and open that airway. Do you hear you know, any audible sounds from the airway? Breathing, I wanna know the rate, I wanna know the rhythm, I wanna know the quality. You know, how many times a minute are they breathing? Do they have good tidal volume? Do you see good chest rise with your patients? Um, listen to those breath sounds of that patient. What do you hear? Circulation will be next. We want to know a pulse, check a pulse. We want to know the rate, the rhythm, the quality of that pulse. What is their skin color, temp, and condition? Are they pale, are they cool, are they sweaty? Are they warm and dry? Are they beet red? Could we have, you know, some other type of emergency going on? And back to final step is your actual treatment and you're gonna make transport decision. Like I said, that's your final step of your primary survey. We will discuss that further into the course, but this is your primary survey. So in order to recap what we talked about today is we talked about not every aspect of patient assessment. We're just kind of starting our first couple of layers to get ready. So our scene size up, we discussed, and we're gonna practice. Our primary survey, we discussed today, and we'll practice in lab. And we're gonna practice these things from here on out. We're just gonna to continue to build. So maybe, you know, the next few classes we'll move into secondary assessment, get some patient history, doing some reassessments. But for right now, let's focus on our scene size up and our primary surveys. You guys have any questions? No? Let's take a break, and once we get finished with break, we'll, we'll go to lab. <laughs>